Rousseau, 1712 to 1778. Those who think that the personal lives of thinkers are irrelevant to an assessment of their work can cite in their support the example of Jean Jacques Rousseau. This is because there are respects in which Rousseau's behavior was at times dramatically inconsistent with his professed views. For example, in his On Education, he advances a theory of education which displays much sympathy with the child's viewpoint, beginning with criticism of the practice of wrapping babies tightly in swaddling clothes instead of letting them move freely and criticizing even more severely the practice of mothers delegating their babies to nurses. Yet the moment each of his own five children was born, he left it on the doorstep of the Foundling Hospital in Paris. Again, he was eloquent in arguing for natural and open human relationships, yet behaved with paranoid suspicion of people who tried to help him, a frequent circumstance given that his life was often a troubled one. Rousseau was born in Geneva, Switzerland, and always felt proud of being a Genevan citizen. His mother died mere days after his birth, and when he was age 10, his father, a watchmaker, left him and his brother to be cared for by an uncle. He subsequently worked as a servant and a secretary in various parts of France and Italy, and for a time enjoyed the patronage of a, of a noblewoman, Francois Louise de Warrens, who helped him get an education, and when he was age 20, took him as her lover. He learned musical performance and composition while in her household. Later, he had some success as a composer. Madame de Warrens arranged for Rousseau to serve on the staff of the French ambassador to Venice. Um, <clears throat> but he disliked the work and went instead to Paris. Not long before going there, he had unsuccessfully submitted an invocative scheme of musical notation to its Academy des Sciences. On arriving in Paris, his career began in earnest. He met Le Vasseur, thereafter his lifelong companion and mother of the children he gave up for adoption, and he met Denis Diderot, chief editor of the Enlightenment's great endeavor, the Encyclopédie. They became friends, engaging in eager daily conversations. Diderot introduced him to the intellectual work of Paris, and Rousseau wrote several articles of, on music for the Encyclopédie. This led to further commissions for that work, among them the article which launched Rousseau's reputation, the entry on political economy. His reputation was most fully made, however, by the prize essay he wrote for the Académie de Dijon on the question whether the arts and sciences had contributed to the moral improvement of mankind. Rousseau's answer, contrary to the founding premise of the Encyclopédie and the Enlightenment it championed, was no. An admiring king... Louis XV offered him a pension as a reward for the essay. Rousseau turned it down. In, in 1754, Rousseau returned to Geneva and began to write the series of works in which his subsequent fame rests. The first was The Discourse on Inequality, a development of his Dijon essay. In it, following the lead of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, he per premises the idea of a state of nature and argues that property is the source of social and economic inequality. Quote, the first person who, having enclosed a plot of land, took it into his head to say, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society, end quote. His theory of human nature turns on the idea that, quote, natural man is benignly interested in his own welfare, is naturally compassionate, and requires only food, a woman, and sleep. To be happy. Although he did not coin the phrase the noble savage, it captures his view of the uncorrupted morals of people in the state of nature whom he regarded as occupying the high point in human development between the brutish nature of animals and the decadent nature of civilized humanity. The book that made Rousseau celebrated and admired throughout Europe was his novel Julie, Ou la Nouvelle Héloïse, presented as a series of letters between two lovers living in the exquisite natural beauty of the alpine landscape. It was published in 1761. As the subtitle suggests, its model was the correspondence between the medieval lovers, uh, Peter Adlard and Hel Helois. It was a tremendous bestseller and prompted a storm of emotion among its readers who wrote of weeping and sobbing, sighing and suffering seizures, 
especially over the profoundly poignant death of the heroine Julie at the end. It gave the 18th century's cult of sensibility a major boost and did the same for the budding, tour tourism, the budding tourism industry of the Alpine region. In 1762, Rousseau published The Social Contract and On Education. The first opens with the famous line, Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. The second contains a section entitled The Profession of a Vicar, which he sets out a Unitarian defense of relig religious belief contrary to the Trinitarian theologies of both the Catholic and major Protestant confessions. Unitarianism holds that God is a single person and that Jesus was not God but man. Catholic and most Protestant theologies hold that God is three persons in one, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This would by itself have been enough to get him into trouble, but he added the view that all religions are equally meritor uh, meritorious and that there is no such thing as original sin or divine revelation. The idea of what is natural to human nature underlay his theory of education. He argued in On Education that the stages of education for a child should mirror the stages of human history, beginning with the unfettered natural state in early childhood and proceeding with general or a gradual entry into the economic and social relations of life. These two books pr provoked much controversy. They represented a turning away, a repentance, have you, from the materialism and empiricism of such Enlightenment thinkers as Diderot, <clears throat> who therefore took issues with Rousseau. He and Diderot ceased to be friends. Theologians and the temporal authorities who supported the theologians were even more incensed. His books were banned in consequence, and so was he. Neither the French nor the Swiss authorities would allow him residence in their countries. Voltaire offered to shelter him, and so did Frederick the Great of Prussia, who, on the basis of Julie and Emile, said of him, quote, I think poor Rousseau has missed his vocation. He should have been a hermit, a desert father, ce celebrated for his austerities and uh, flagellations. He added, I conclude that the morals of Rousseau are as pure as his mind is illogical. Instead, Rousseau accepted an invitation from David Hume to go to England. To begin with, he was courted as a celebrity there, but when opinion turned against him and his propensity to paranoia had been inflamed by a prank played on him by Horace uh, Walpole, a public quarrel broke out and he um, and Theris left England precipitately. In his latter years, Rousseau dedicated himself to botany and to writing self-justifications and offenses, including his famous Confessions, uh, not to be confused with the Confessions of Augustine, uh, the first autobiography of its kind. Um, he died following a stroke in the summer of 1778, age 66, leaving incomplete his last work, Daydreams in a Solitary Walker, in which he said that even though he felt like an outcast from society, he had nevertheless found serenity, tranquility, peace, even happiness. Rousseau's chief contribution to philosophy is his political theory. The principal text in which it is set out is the social contract. Though the discourses on the origins of inequality and on political economy, among others, amplify and clarify its doctrines. In the social contract, Rousseau sets himself to offer a resolution to a problem that he had described at the end of the discourse on inequality. There he said that the result of humanity's emergence from the state of nature is an unavoidable but inequality fostering dependence of people on each other because they are no longer able to meet their own needs. This threatens instability and conflict, which drives people to establish an authority to keep the peace between them, but this authority merely institutionalizes and reinforces the inequality that mutual dependency has prompted, giving it the force of law. Such an arrangement would favor those with wealth and power, exposing the poor and powerless thereby to exploitation. In the social contract, Rousseau sought to outline a way that the benefits of social life might be enjoyed consistently with individual freedom for all people. The key concept in his argument to this end is the general will, which we still, to, we still refer to today. What Rousseau meant by the general will is unclear and is open to being understood in very different, different ways. The two most common interpretations of the general will are, first, that the general will is, quote, the will of the people, end quote, as this is understood in the democratic sense of a consensus of everyone agreeing together. The second is a more abstract notion, something like a transcendentally conceived common purpose or interest that exists apart from the actual preferences of any given individual. Both inter interpretations can be backed by what Rousseau writes. 
though his text seems to favor the second. Quote, there is often a great deal of difference between the will of all and the general will. The general will looks only to the common interest. The former, the will of all, considers private interest as only a sum of private wills. But take away from these same wills the pulses and minuses, the pluses and minuses that cancel each other out, and the remaining sum of the differences is the general will. End quote. Both interpretations of the general will are consistent with the further view that it is an idealization, and as such, an ideal that no state actually embodies, which has the consequence, if this is what Rousseau meant, that no state has true political legitimacy. Whether or not this is an implication Rousseau conceives of the general will as always being directed at the good of each and of all together, which means that it can never be in conflict with the good of any individual. It is this that offers a means of reconciling the existence of the state with freedom as a social and political value. The legitimate state is one that embodies the general will. Therefore, to be free is to be obedient to the general will. Rousseau talks of the demand to obey the general will as being forced to be free. The appearance of paradox in this idea is reduced when one notes that he contrasts the kind of freedom experienced in the state of nature, or natural freedom, with the kind one enjoys in a legitimate state, civil freedom. The former, natural freedom, is complete license to do as I wish, but that means that I am vulnerable to being prey, the prey of others licensed to do me harm. By contrast, in civil freedom, I am protected by laws that express the general will, and I am therefore secure in my life and property. An idea that anticipates Immanuel Kant's view in Rousseau's claim that in civil society people have moral freedom because they subject themselves to moral laws that they have imposed on themselves. The introduction of this idea adds yet another kind of freedom to the repertoire of freedoms Rousseau identifies. But one possibility is that the idea of civil freedom as obedience to the general will is close to the idea of moral autonomy in the sense that one's participation in willing the general will, in effect, makes one a legislator of the laws, including moral laws, under which one lives. Perhaps it is relevant to adduce the perspective on the question of freedom provided by the discourse of the vicar in Rousseau's email. The vicar in that tale, having been defrocked as a result of a sexual scandal and finding himself in a bleak state of personal crisis afterwards, undertakes a Descartes-like review of all his beliefs to see if he knows anything with certainty. One thing he finds himself to be certain of is that he is a free-willed being not subject to the physical laws of causality, but at complete liberty to choose and act as he wills. If we take this conception of freedom to be what Rousseau meant in the social contract, where freedom consists in obeying the general will, then the implication is that the general will is something that, whether consciously or not, the individual indeed wills. As with the idea of moral freedom, the act of obeying the general will is therefore an act of autonomy. Rousseau dislikes both the ideas of what might now be called representative democracy, uh, with an elected legislature and the more uh, Hobbesian idea of a sovereign individual or body elected or appointed by the people. He thought that such arraignments involved an alienation of one's self-rule and thus a form of slavery. His view invites the problem that most societies are too numerous to be able to govern themselves by an assembly in the equivalent of the Greek agora, so it seems impractical. Some commentators suggest Rousseau meant to distinguish between the sovereign in a state and the government of the state, whether the latter, the government, is the body that carries out the will of the former, the, the sovereign. So the people is sovereign, and the administrators of their will do not have power over them, but obey them. Rousseau was, however, a pessimist about politics. With some justification, he surmised that governments would soon enough come to exercise power over the people rather than being subject to them. That justification is provided by history, including the history of the representative democracies that have come into existence since his time. In his views of religion, as expressed both in Emile and in the social contract, Rousseau enraged his contemporaries, but an aspect of them was the need for toleration and the promotion of what he calls a civic religion, which by promoting belief in a deity and an afterlife in which reward and punishment are due, would actually psychologically help to ensure that people behave well. He had a conventional view of women. They are helpmates to men, or helpmates, and must be submissive to them. Um, of course, this, as we would see today, um, is not very highly prized. Uh, he thought that men do not need women, he says in his On Education, but they desire them. Um, whereas 
women both desire and need men. Um, he adds that women are cleverer and more practical than men, however. Uh, their inferior status seems to be justified by their being physically weaker than men. Um, and as this last thought prompts one to think, the opinion of Rousseau held by Frederick the Great of Prussia seems, if one of the off on the generous side, about right. Um, and, of course, we always see from, uh, I think it was Sir Francis Bacon who said that it, weak men um, ma get married. Um, and so, but in any case, uh, we have... Jean Rousseau, uh, he wrote Daydreams of a Solitary Walker um, before he died. He had a uh, discourse on inequality, a uh, discourse on political economy, and uh, he wrote On Education, the Emil, uh, Encyclopedia. Um, some of his uh, composed pieces are in Diderot's Encyclopedia, and then he has, obviously, The Social Contract. So thank you for going along with me in this journey in philosophy. Thank you.